and welcome to Hot and Heavy, the Elaine Bennis podcast. I'm your host, Shivani Desai. Today I'll be talking about Season 7, Episode 14, The Cadillac. Hello, everyone. Happy holidays. I hope everyone's doing well out there. I'm doing okay. Just, um, you know, last few days, five days until Christmas from the day I'm recording this. And I feel pretty ready, but I'm getting into the phase I get into around this time of year where I feel like I need 8,000 more things, whether it be stocking stuffers or food or, uh, oh, let me pick up a last minute gift for this person or that person or, you know, so I'm I'm getting into that phase. I've gotten better with controlling that and making sure I just don't go nuts in these last few days, but um, before before Christmas. But at any rate, it's it's bubbling up for sure. Other than that, I am uh, looking forward to my mother arriving and she's going to be here for a couple of weeks. And then we are headed to to Michigan to uh, visit some relatives out there. And it, it'll be it'll be a nice break. We definitely, definitely need a break. <laughs> Speaking of, I will be taking the next couple of weeks off from the podcast. I'll remind you of that at the end of the episode. But um, yeah, this is my last podcast of 2023. And uh, it is a supersized episode. So I guess that's my gift, my holiday gift to all of you. A supersized episode. The Cadillac is one hour long, or it was an hour when it aired. It's around 44 minutes if you're getting technical. And I'm going to do it all in one episode. I usually try and break these up, but I made the decision to just go for it all the way so that I can relax for a couple weeks and I don't have to come back to the same episode. I just wanted to make a clean break, if that makes sense. Uh, Something else I've been doing, I have been listening to another podcast called Second in Command, and it is a Veep rewatch podcast hosted by Matt Walsh and Tim Simons, who play Mike McClintock and Jonah Ryan in the show, if any of you are familiar with Veep. And if you aren't, shame on you. This is me shaming you. If you're a fan of Julia Louis-Dreyfus, there is no excuse to not have watched Veep. I mean, really, it is it is her at her highest level of everything. I I can't even I, I can't even. It's, I just have to end the sentence there. I'd known about the podcast since it came out for a couple of years, but at the time, I think I was like, ah, I can't add another podcast. I just thought you guys have so many podcasts. Um, but anyway, I uh, was prompted to listen to it because JLD herself had posted an interview she did with the guys for an episode. And so I was like, you know what? I'll just start at the beginning. So that means I just started at the beginning of Veep once again. I've watched that show uh, over and over again. Although I'm more like I pick and choose my episodes that I'd like to watch. You really can't go wrong. I mean, you just uh, blindfold and just like with your remote pick any episode, you'll be fine. You will laugh. You'll cringe at some of (laughs) the language in it. Um, And then you'll just overall be dazzled by Julia Louis-Dreyfus's portrayal of Selena Meyer. It's just one of the best comedic performances in history, bar none. I know I'm biased, but I don't give a shit. I'm, t- I'm speaking the truth. It's, it's undeniable. Okay, so let's get into this supersized episode of Seinfeld. The synopsis from, now I, I haven't said this in a while, but the synopses that I read are from a coffee table book that was included in the big box set of um, all the Seinfeld DVDs. And so I'm going to be reading two different synopses since they divided it up her, um, you know, part one and part two. So I'll just read it all together. It's as follows. Jerry buys his parents a new Cadillac, leading Jack Klompas to accuse Morty of embezzling from their Florida condo association. Elaine's relationship with Jerry changes when she finds out what he earns. A still engaged George is set up on a date with Oscar winning actress Marissa Tomei, while the cable company is looking for Kramer. So that was a part one synopsis. Part two is... Morty's impeachment from the presidency of his condo association is decided by the woman from whom Jerry stole a marble rye weeks earlier. Susan thinks George is having an affair with Elaine. George's romantic prospects with Marissa Tomei turn bleak after he tells her he's engaged. 
Kramer's mind games with the cable company lead him to be chased around Manhattan. Elaine's interest in Jerry is rekindled after she learns he makes a lot of money. This episode was written by the creators of the show, the OGs, Larry David and Jerry Seinfeld. All right, we start out the episode in Jerry's apartment. Jerry arrives home from being on the road and Kramer enters. He's really excited (laughs) to see Jerry. It's actually kind of sweet. Jerry's going on about how this job he just came from, best job he's ever had. The money was unbelievable. I mean, the highest paying job he's ever had. So Kramer wants to know how much. And he's like, "Eh, I don't really want to tell you. It's going to affect our relationship. No, no, no. Just show me the check. So Jerry shows him the check. And what happens? Immediately, (laughs) Kramer feels inferior. He feels this really affected the relationship. I don't know how to talk to you. (laughs) He asks Jerry, what are you going to do with all that money? Almost accusatory, like he's kind of upset that Jerry made that much money on this job. After cracking a joke about donating it to charity, which haha, no, fuck a charity. He does say that he's thinking about buying his father a Cadillac. You know, he's never been able to afford one. And yeah, you know, he's going to do it. Kramer says he's going to score some big points with the man upstairs. Oh, isn't that what it's all about? All right, next we're in Monks. Elaine is uh, in a booth with a friend, and she's asking about Pippi Longstocking. Who was she? Was she involved with Hitler? Friend said, maybe. George enters. He's all miffed that Jerry is late to meet him and sits with Elaine. (laughs) She's like, hello, (laughs) you remember Katie? Oh, yeah, he says, we met skiing that one time. You're married to the eye guy. Also ear, nose, and throat. He cracks a joke about noses. What's the worst that could happen? They get, what, stuffed? Katie says, oh, he's funny. No, oh, you don't have to tell me, Elaine says. <laughs> ladies, ladies, please. Elaine tells Katie that George got engaged, and she goes, oh. He's like, what was that reaction? Is that bad? I would have set you up with a friend of mine. You're perfect for her. She loves quirky, funny guys. Of course, George's first <laughs> inquiry is bald. Loves bald. Love's bald. He can't believe it. Who is she? Marissa Tomei. Yeah, a silent moment. George and Elaine just stare at her. George clarifies, the actress? Yeah. George goes on and on about how much he loves her. And Katie's like, yeah, she's just been sitting at home. George turns to Elaine. Why didn't you tell me Katie was friends with Marissa Tomei? Oh, I don't know what I was thinking. All right, the actress in this scene who plays Katie is Annabelle Gerwich. She's also appeared in Charmed, The Cable Guy, and Dexter. She's also a very successful writer with her work appearing in multiple publications. She also has a couple best-selling books. Very accomplished woman, very talented, of course. Uh, But uh, in this episode, she's just very meh to me. Not great, not bad. And I love when we meet Elaine's friends. I mean, Katie comes out of nowhere But they really didn't give Katie anything (laughs) except the fact that she was connected to Marissa Tomei. And my take on the scene, I just think overall the scene is very underwhelming. The whole Pippi Longstocking conversation, it's so bad. (laughs) It's not the greatest. I just wish they would have come up with something better. I know it's just three or four lines back and forth between George uh, arriving and that's when the scene really starts to, you know, gain momentum. Momentum, same thing. And... You know, they're always able to write stuff for the guys that are like just couplets of dialogue that work really well. So I just wish they would have done that with Elaine and her friend Katie. (laughs) It just was so mad. Like (laughs) even Katie's reactions, she's like, I don't know, maybe like what? This is what is this conversation? And plus, I mean, this is a totally new friend we're seeing of Elaine's. And there just could have been some more personal conversation, something just something more substantial. It also feels really odd to me that Elaine has no reaction to the Marissa Tomei reveal, like none at all. Her stare, like when she stares at Katie, it sort of tells me that she didn't know Katie was friends with Marissa Tomei. It looked like it, it, even though JLD doesn't give much with her reaction, she's just very kind of like stares at her. But it's definitely a facial expression of just like, huh, I didn't know that. And to quote Jerry, I would just feel like you would have had some reaction. And apparently Elaine would say, well, I don't. It's it's kind of big news. I mean, if you find out your friend is friends with like an Oscar winning A-list actress, you're not going to be like, what? 
also, given that this involves George, I feel like Elaine could have had much more to say, or at the very least, ask how Katie knows Marissa Tomei. I mean, I agree with Jerry later when he says it seems like a reasonable question to ask. And Elaine asking it would have kind of tracked better. Like George is going to be all distracted by the fact that he's actually Marissa Tomei's type. But I could see Elaine going like, how do you know her? I didn't know that or something. There's really no reason not to reveal why Katie knows Marissa Tomei. So it's just, (laughs) as you can tell, it kind of irritates me. (laughs) I do like the whole Marissa Tomei storyline, but this scene that, that introduces that is very average to me. Okay, next we're in Jerry's apartment. Jerry's on the phone, setting up the whole Cadillac deal, wants it fully loaded for his dad. George enters, Jerry hangs up, and he tells George, I'm buying a Cadillac for my dad. Oh, you're a very good son. Yeah, I'm a very good boy. George changes the subject to Marissa Tomei, (laughs) of course. He asks Jerry, "Are are you familiar with her? He's like, oh, yeah. He says that Elaine's friend Katie is friends with her. Jerry is surprised. How does she know Marissa Tomei? George, of course, doesn't know. (laughs) It's not the point. Anyway, uh, Katie said she could have fixed me up with her, you know, if I wasn't engaged. Oh, apparently I'm just her type, George says. You know the odds of me being anyone's type? But apparently Marissa Tomei loves funny, quirky, bald men. And Jerry tells him, you know, she won an Academy Award. George is sort of insulted, like, I don't know that. My cousin Vinny, I love that. He marvels at how he could be going on a date with an Oscar winner and that she's so beautiful, just his type, the dark hair, the full lips. Oh, you like full lips. Oh, I love full lips. Something you can really put the lipstick on. Jerry once again has to dig in that knife, twist it a little bit. (laughs) Too bad you're engaged. There's a knock on the door and it's a cable guy looking for Kramer. Yeah, I've just been waiting here for a while. Could you please tell him that I'm uh, looking for him? Jerry says, yeah, sure. Closes the door. Nice people. Jerry comes back to the couch and George asks, you know, what if he did it? Went out with Marissa Tomei? Maybe a cup of coffee? Jerry isn't so sure. You know, would you tell Susan about it? Not necessarily. Well, if you can't tell her about it, there's something wrong. Of course there's something wrong. We had a pact. (laughs) Kramer enters. Jerry tells him about the cable guy looking for him. Well, Kramer knows why. He's been getting HBO and Showtime for free, so they want to take it out. And Kramer is not at all sympathetic to this guy. He has passed beef with the cable company, kept him waiting all day 10 years ago, showed up and tracked mud all over his clean floors. Oh, and now the shoe's on the other foot. Jerry's like, I've never seen you like this. Oh, you don't want to get on my bad side. All right, next we're in George's apartment. George is watching my cousin Vinny. Susan walks in and says, why are you watching that again? "Uh, I don't know, he says. You know, Marissa Tomei won an Oscar for that. Boy, she's beautiful, don't you think? Wish I looked like her. (laughs) Just love. I love George's expressions. And she says, well, turn it off. You're making me jealous. I'm going to think you like her more than you like me. George laughs uncomfortably and Susan exits to the back. And George gets on the phone. He calls Elaine. She says, why are you whispering? Remember what we were talking about at the coffee shop? No. Think for a second. Your friend was talking about me and, you know, Elaine's like, George, I have no idea what you're talking about. The actress. What? Marissa Tomei! (laughs) Susan's like, what? From the bedroom. Oh, nothing. Elaine says, oh, yeah, what about her? Well, he wants to do it. Ugh, Elaine cannot believe it. No way, you're engaged. A cup of coffee, he says. No, George. Elaine, she says, forget it. She hangs up the phone on him and he just keeps yelling her name. Susan enters and George acts like he's yelling at the movie. Oh, the judge! I I hate this guy! My take on this scene... Okay, now we're getting into some good Elaine George stuff. You know, I love that. I love that... (laughs) I just love (laughs) the bit of her not knowing what the hell he's talking about for like three or four beats. She's like, I don't know what you're talking about. (laughs) I feel like any sort of interaction with George, she just erases from her memory right away. (laughs) And how quickly that escalates with George. She's like, think for a second. And uh, good on Elaine for refusing George's sleazy request. Although we know that doesn't last for very long. (laughs) Okay, next we're in Jerry's apartment. Jerry's packing for Florida and Elaine's there. She cannot believe that you bought your father a Cadillac. I mean, she had no idea that he had that kind of money. (laughs) He's like, yeah, I don't like to talk about it. I mean, I knew you were doing well, but 
I didn't know that you were in this kind of a position. She leans forward and kind of gets a little close to him. So when are you coming back from Florida? He's like, I don't know. Play it by ear. Why? She lays on the flirt a little bit more. Things seem a little more exciting when you're around. (laughs) She's just smiling at him. (laughs) You okay? (laughs) What was that? (laughs) Kramer, meanwhile, is at Jerry's door. He's looking through Jerry's peephole to the hallway And he tells him to shush. He's so excited watching this cable guy waiting at his door. And in the hallway, we see George approaching Jerry's door. And the cable guy just goes on and on about how long he's been waiting. And he's getting sick and tired of it. And that he's not going to put up with it much longer. And he walks away. George enters and knocks Kramer in the face. (laughs) He says, the cable guy's looking for you. And Kramer says, yeah, 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 I know. And then he goes back to his place. George says, thanks a lot for yesterday to Elaine. And she explains to Jerry, he wants me to fix him up with Marissa Tomei. I'm not going to be a part of this. He argues it's just a cup of coffee. It's not a fix up. Uh, You want to meet her? You want to see if she likes you? So what? She's like, you're engaged. I am aware. But this is Marissa Tomei, he says. How can I live knowing that I could have been with an Oscar winner? And Elaine says, George, it's cheating. He says it's not cheating if there's no sex. Uh, Yes, it is. Elaine turns to Jerry and asks him, but then she gets distracted by the big stack of money he's counting. She sort of gets mesmerized by it. Like she can almost like almost like she's dizzy with all this money in Jerry's hand. So George convinces her to call and she's like in this daze. She's like, yeah, yeah. okay, okay." As she's dialing the phone, she tells Jerry 8.50 when he seems to have forgotten where he was with the counting. While it's ringing, she asks if, uh, so you need a ride? Or he's like, no, don't be silly. I arranged for a car. You sure? She just stares him down. Maybe I'll let you pick me up. Finally, someone answers the phone and she asks for Katie. And she goes, what? Oh, really? Uh, Well, can you tell her Elaine called? She hangs up and tells George she's in the hospital. She has an arrhythmia. Well, what about Marissa Tomei? All right, my take on this scene. Okay, now we're getting into this one of the uh, plots for Elaine where she (laughs) is just so attracted to Jerry now and all flirty with him. And it's such a delight to watch, especially because of how unreciprocated it is. Like Jerry's reactions to her laying on this like thick, flirty energy. It's just it makes it that much funnier. And JLD is just genius in the scene. That shift when she realizes Jerry is earning so much money. I love, love this. It's uh, it's GD Elaine, gold digger Elaine. And she's amazing. I love her. (laughs) Yeah, she's shallow, but all these people are shallow. It's what we love about the show. Oh, God. And then the inaudible, like, like, (laughs) she's almost just like, "Mm -hmm," just giddy. It gets me every time. And then you contrast flirty GD Elaine with how she talks to George. (laughs) I love that she calls him out, though. Like, you want to see if she likes you and, and you're engaged. You know, she's telling him all the normal things I think people would say to someone who's trying to do something like this. So it's just really fun interactions all around in this scene. Elaine finally agreeing after seeing all the cash in Jerry's hand. It's a, it's a bit broad, but I think it is also clever. <laughs> like we do we do need to eventually get George to Marissa Tomei. So Elaine just getting so mesmerized by seeing all this money. Really funny, really clever. All right, next we're in Florida. Morty is getting yelled at by Helen. He opened a pack of Chips Ahoy when there was a box of snack wells already open. He's like, hey, I wanted Chip Ahoy. If I want a Chip Ahoy, I'm going to have it. Anyway, Jerry walks in. Surprise! Oh my God. God, Helen and Morty are so excited. To what do we owe this honor? And he says, come outside. Whenever Jerry's in town, something exciting happens. And then we cut to the sparkling Cadillac in the parking lot. Jerry tells Morty that he bought it for him. (gasps) Morty is so excited, but Helen says, no, he hasn't got that kind of money. Oh, get out of here, Mr. Big Shot. (laughs) She also says, your father doesn't need a car. And he says, yes, I do. We're keeping it over my dead body. And they start fighting over the keys. <laughs> and Jerry says, well, this worked out just as I had hoped. All right, next we're in Kramer's apartment. A quick scene of him screening his calls. And he listens to the message from the cable guy complaining about all the waiting he had to do and that he's not going to get away with it. And Kramer is just laughing away. 
Next, back in Florida, Morty is sitting in the Cadillac, excited about how his seat has memory. And, you know, in case he goes to prison, he comes out, his seat will go exactly where he wants it. And Jerry's like, yeah, that's what I was thinking. Jack Klompus walks up and greets them, and he finds out Jerry gave Morty the car. He can't believe it. You want to take a ride, Morty says. Jack says no, but Morty insists. Do I have to take a ride? Believe me, I've ridden in Cadillacs hundreds of times. Thousands. Morty's like, thousands? Oh, you think you're such a big shot now because you have a Cadillac. And then they (laughs) exchange ahs at each other. Jack leaves. Morty says to Jerry, you believe that guy? And Jerry adds his own. Ah. All right, next we're in the hospital. (laughs) God. George is trying to convince an unconscious Katie in her hospital bed, trying to convince her that you know, saying that he was engaged was just something you say, like, like go and steady. Anyway, I uh, watched my cousin Vinny tells her he'd really like to take a meeting with Marissa Tomei. So uh, what do you say? And of course, she just lies there. Move a pinky if it's yes. Can you move a pinky? All right, next we're in Kramer's apartment. Kramer gets a call from the phone company, but can tell it's the cable guy trying to say he needs to come by. Kramer even looks out the window and sees the cable guy on the payphone. So he tricks him with the call waiting trap and the guy falls for it. And Cable Guy tries to save it. Oh, I I was looking at the wrong work order. Kramer says, could you hold on a second? I've got something on the stove. And he puts his phone near a speaker that's playing hold music, like the Muzak type music. And we see the guy waiting on the payphone. And all of a sudden, Kramer yells out from a cab, channels on HBO tonight. Why don't you stop by? All right, next we're back in Florida. Morty is conducting a board meeting as president. And he talks about this fence that he's still pricing out. And one of the members says, it's been broken for six months. What the hell are you doing? And he says, as the president, he has to look out for the best price. And right now, he doesn't think it's cost feasible. And Jack Klompis says, sorry, I just start laughing because everything Jack Klompis does to me is just perfect. It's just from, from his crazy ass eyebrows to every look of his eye like it's so it's Jack Klompis ranks up there and probably the top five side characters on this show I mean he is uh this recurring character I just cannot get enough of him but anyway so whenever I start talking about what he's doing in the scene I just can't help but visualize it and start laughing anyway Jack says I bet you don't what And Jack says he cannot hold it in any longer. And he accuses Morty of stealing funds from the treasury. Another board member asks for proof. You want proof? He's driving around in a brand new Cadillac. My son bought me that Cadillac. Your son could never afford that car. We all saw his act at the playhouse. (laughs) And someone else says, Jack's right. He stinks. So then they all agree for a full investigation. Then we cut to the Seinfeld apartment. Morty says he may be impeached. Helen says, I told you we shouldn't have let him buy us that car. Jerry says, look, I have the bill of sale. It proves that I bought it. It doesn't matter. They think we're in cahoots. Evelyn enters. We've met her before. And uh, she has the scoop. She's definitely the uh, condo gossip. She says, three to impeach, three against impeachment, and one undecided. Mabel Choate. Jerry wonders who that is. Oh, she's the longest member of the board. She's very hard to deal with, Morty says. Helen suggests inviting her over for coffee to explain our side. That's a good idea. Evelyn heads out and says, I'll see you tonight at the Lichtenbergs. Helen's like, what are you talking about? They're having a party. We weren't invited. Oh, probably they think you're too good for them because of the car. (laughs) We're losing all our friends. Next, we're in Kramer's apartment. This time, Kramer gets a legitimate call from the utilities company, and they need to do a safety check at his apartment. But Kramer checks the payphone outside from his window, and, uh, well, it's not its not a man on the phone, so he's like, oh, you're good. You're really good. The guy's like, what are you talking about? And Kramer hangs up on him. All right, next, we're in George's apartment. Susan enters and finds George watching only you. That's another Marissa Tomei movie. And you've seen that one, too. What? You got a little thing for her? 
George just laughs that off. Yeah, I have a thing for Marissa Tomei. Just babbles on and on like she'd ever go out with me, like like I'm just her type. She's an Oscar winner. Besides, I don't even know her. It's not like someone's trying to fix this up. What are you talking about? <laughs> Susan exits to the kitchen. George watches her and then imagines Marissa Tomei coming out of that same door, all dressed up and beautiful. She comes over and sits with him on the couch. She asks, have I told you how much I love you today? Not in the last 15 minutes. Well, I do. I love you very much. And I love you, Marissa. And she says, well, get dressed. We're going to be late for the premiere. They start kissing, and then when we're back to reality, oops, there goes rabbit. He, oh, sorry, no. Uh, we're back to reality. Susan walks out to find George making out with a pillow on the couch. <laughs> he sits back all satisfied and sees <laughs> Susan staring at him. <laughs> she just turns around and walks out. I'd probably do the same thing. Okay, well, the actress here <laughs> is Marissa Tomei. She plays Marissa Tomei. You may know her from about a thousand things. I first fell in love with her on A Different World. It was a Cosby Show spinoff where she played Denise's college roommate. And then my full-on obsession with her started after my cousin Vinny. Much like George, I love that movie. There was actually all this controversy because she won for her portrayal as Mona Lisa Vito. And granted, I didn't see the other nominated performances, but she is so brilliant and magnetic in My Cousin Vinny. I mean, she steals every scene. It's one of my favorite movies to this day. We watch it at least every couple months. And I think she's very cute in this episode, except for her hairdo. Holy crap. The hair, it's 1996. So <laughs> this is kind of the Rachel do. But some people went like the hairdo she has in the park with George is like an extreme version. Like, what is that? <laughs> it's, it's not very easy to make Marissa Tomei look bad. And it's not even like she looks bad. She's still absolutely beautiful, adorable. But that hair, oh my God. Like I said, it's very 1996. At any rate, I, I love that one of my favorite actresses has a cameo in one of my favorite shows of all time. It's an overabundance of faves, if you will. Also, do yourself a favor and look her up. I mean, she is going to turn 60 next year. And it's just not fair. She defies aging. Like she looks incredible to this day. Oh, Love Marissa Tomei. All right, next we're in Florida. Jerry is tossing and turning on the foldout, a terrible bar in the middle of his back. But the phone rings and it's Elaine. Hi, Jerry. He's like, Elaine, what's going on? She says, well, I was thinking I'm not really doing anything this weekend. Maybe I'll come down there and hang out. You want to hang out at phase two at the Pines of Mar Gables? She laughs all flirty. <laughs> It's just two hours by plane. And she gets another call. She's so pissed. Damn it. Don't hang up, Jerry. <laughs> she clicks over. Yeah. It's George. And he's like, you have to get me Marissa Tomei's phone number. Ugh, she yells at him. She's on the other line, but she promises she will get him the number. George is all happy. So she clicks over back to Jerry. So what do you think? He's like, I don't think so. Anyway, I'll be back on Monday. Well, if you need that ride, give me a call. I'll meet you at the gate, Jerry. Yeah, whatever. He's like, see you later. Jerry, Jerry. Bye. He's like, bye. Uh, my dig on this scene. Uh, this is easily one of my favorite JLD scenes of the entire series. Again, it's the same energy between them from the earlier scene. She's giddy, flirty Elaine, and he's all confused, nonchalant Jerry. We also get treated to the contrast when George beeps in on the call waiting and she's so annoyed to be interrupted. <laughs> and that bye at the end, the look on her face and just the, <laughs> it's just absolute perfection by JLD. All right, next we're at Monks. George is on the payphone with Marissa Tomei making plans and he hangs up and Elaine's at a booth. She's like, well... George is giddy. He just got off the phone with Marissa Tomei. I just spoke to Marissa Tomei. He says he wasn't even that nervous. You know, usually he's pacing all over the room. Elaine's like, all right, well, that's all the time we have today. And she tries to leave. But George says, wait, wait, wait a second. We have to come up with an alibi for Susan. Elaine's like, oh, OK. You want to say you're with me? Fine. That's fine. He's like, wait, wait. 
They need to come up with what they were doing. Why are they together? She's like, George, what's the difference? Because if you ever see her and it comes up, we have to be in sync. Uh, Elaine sits back down. Okay, why are we together? Elaine comes up with, oh, okay, well, maybe I have to go to the dentist and I'm frightened and I need you to come with me. George is like, that's no good. Okay, fine. Elaine is so offended by the way he just rejected her suggestion. Hey, 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 let's not get so defensive, he says. This is a give and take. Well, I thought it was good, and I thought you could have been more tactful. Look, we've never worked together, George says. I have a certain way of working. Jerry knows. You know, this isn't a personal thing. We're just trying to come up with the best possible lie. Okay, okay, fine, she says. George comes up with, okay, you're having problems with your boyfriend, and we're meeting up to discuss. She's like, I don't have a boyfriend. Well, Susan doesn't know that. We say you do. Eh. George is like, it's good. Trust me. Well, she thinks her dentist thing was just as good. (laughs) George disagrees. All right. So they discuss more in detail George's idea. They decide that her boyfriend is named Art Vandelay. He's an importer exporter. So Elaine's like, okay, the problem is that he's thinking about quitting the exporting and just focusing on the importing. And this is causing a problem because... Why not do both? What? You don't like that either? (laughs) She says after seeing George's face. He's like, it's very complicated. Elaine gets offended again. The way I see it, it's all you and none of my ideas are getting in. You know, you know it all and I miss stupid, right? (laughs) He just puts his head in his hands. My take on this scene, I think it's a really great scene. Like I've said before, this is the best relationship on the show, George and Elaine. And I love how it breathes. The scene very much takes its time. In the trivia portion of IMDb, I read that this was supposed to be a parody of when Jerry and George are discussing his plan for the stakeout in the first season. So I can see that. It's it's very similar. They're trying to figure out their stories. Both Jason Alexander and JLD play this scene just to perfection. Elaine is so earnest in her suggestions and so, and sort of like excited about him. I, I, I love that energy where she's like, hmm, okay. So he's thinking about giving up the exporting and I'm like, why not do both? Like she seems so excited. And even further back with the, with the dentist thing, oh, she's like her face after is like, that's great, right? So for George to be so dismissive, I can see why she gets so offended. And I have to say, I'm not a fan of Elaine's idea either. I'm with George. It's very complicated. Why Why importer, exporter? Why is this the problem? Why can't it just be like he's bad in bed or something? I don't know. <laughs> All right, next we're back in Florida. Morty is stressing about Mabel Choate's visit, telling Helen what to prepare. <laughs> Morty, you're driving me crazy, she says. But he needs this to go well. You know, he can't be impeached. Well, you want to drive a Cadillac? You have to expect to pay the price. I mean, Helen's just not helping at all. Mabel arrives as grumpy as can be. She says, nobody's taking my coat and she doesn't want coffee and blows off a compliment about her scarf. Jerry enters and Helen introduces him and he recognizes her right away as the woman he mugged for the marble rye, which Mabel ends up telling that story when she finds out that Jerry's from New York. She's never going back. Jerry is so uncomfortable. He's like, yeah, there are some sickos out there. She's like, you look very familiar. Have we ever met? Helen's like, well, he's on TV. He's a comedian. Nah, I don't watch TV. And Jerry makes a quick exit out the door. (laughs) Then Mabel asks Morty, so what is this about? All right, next we're in George's apartment. George is about to leave and Susan asks where he's going. Ah, I'm headed to see Elaine. She's having issues with her boyfriend. Huh, I didn't even know she was dating anyone. Yeah, yeah, she's uh, seeing Art Vandelay. What does he do? He's an importer-exporter. What kind of problems are they having? (laughs) Just a side note. (laughs) That line read is so interesting to me. (laughs) What kind of problems are they having? She seems very sad. (laughs) George tells the complicated alibi with very little enthusiasm. You can tell he's clearly annoyed he went along with it, that he's thinking about quitting the exporting and just... um, focusing on the importing. And it's a problem because she thinks the exporting is just as important as the importing. Susan wastes no time. Are you having an affair with Elaine? He laughs it off. What? Well, if I were, I wouldn't tell you I was going to see Elaine. I'd I'd make up some other person, then go see (laughs) Elaine. Uh Uh-huh. 
and George exits. All right, next we're on the street. Kramer is walking home with some groceries and notices the Plaza Cable van pursuing him. Then we see a chase on foot through the streets, including Times Square, over walls, through the park, on rooftops, and it ends with the cable guy screaming, I'll get you, Kramer! The music from this scene, the sort of chase music, really reminds me of the chase music in The Fugitive, if any of you are familiar. And if you're not familiar with The Fugitive, shame on you, shaming you again. All right, next we're back in Florida. Helen and Morty called Jerry for dinner. (laughs) It's 4.30. He's like, what? Why why do we have to go now? And they want to catch the early bird special. And he's like, no, no, I'm not force feeding myself a steak at 4.30. He wants to eat at a decent hour and he'll treat. Helen's like, fine. She sits on the couch. We'll wait. But it's unheard of. All right, next we're at the park. George and Marissa Tomei are sitting on a bench. He's dazzling her with his manure material. (laughs) And she really is dazzled. She's like, you're so right. I never thought of that. Ma and (laughs) newer. She's very charmed by how spontaneously funny he is. And she wonders how someone like him, so bald and so quirky and funny, how is it that you're not taken? Well, George says, the thing is, I'm sort of engaged. What? Well, Marissa Tomei punches him in the face and leaves. Next, we're back in Florida. The Seinfelds are pulling up to the restaurant in the Cadillac. Oh, there's a spot right in front. Always, Jerry, always. <laughs> Their friends are coming out from the early bird meal, including Jack Klompas, who chastises the Seinfelds for skipping the early bird. Must be nice to have that kind of money. Jack calls over to a buddy. Hey, look who's eating at six o'clock. He tells him to enjoy his last meal in office. Morty and Jack go back and forth for a bit and Jerry can't take it. All right, let's eat already. All right, next we're in Elaine's apartment. Susan arrives and clearly something's on her mind. Elaine invites her in and she doesn't waste any time. Are you having an affair with George? Elaine laughs so hard she has to sit down she's like don't be ridiculous why would anyone want to sleep well i mean obviously why would you think that she tells elaine about the conversation earlier and the problem with her boyfriend elaine confirms though yeah yeah definitely needed to talk with him i was having a problem with my boyfriend susan asks art vandalay yeah yeah art vandalay Susan feels so stupid and apologizes, and Elaine assures her it's totally forgotten. Before leaving, Susan stops and asks if George was helpful. Elaine says, yeah. And then she incorrectly explains the importing-exporting issue, and Susan calls her on it. Wait, I thought he wanted to give up the the importing. Oh, (laughs) what did I say? The exporting? And then she asks, well, what does he import? Chips. Uh, potato, some corn. And what does he export? Diapers. Susan apologizes again for bothering Elaine and leaves. As soon as she's gone, Elaine runs to the phone and tries to catch George. Come on, come on, pick up, pick up. She needs to let him know this new information. My take on this scene, I think the scene is fantastic. I think I had incorrectly said that in that pool guy episode with the worlds colliding, that that was the last we see of these two actresses together, Elaine and Susan interacting. So I totally forgot about this scene. It was such a pleasant, I'm like, oh yeah, this is a great scene. And both Heidi Swedberg and JLD are great. Some fantastic laugh acting from JLD here, (laughs) which we know she's so good at. Once again, we see like that hesitant sort of energy from Elaine when she has to answer Susan's questions about what art imports and exports. And I have to say, Susan is pretty shrewd. I mean, she knows exactly what she's doing here. I mean, so she confirmed, okay, Elaine's not the other woman. But she also heard George loud and clear when he said that he would say he was seeing someone else and then go see the actual woman he's having the affair with. So, you know, she's getting her intel. So I think that's very shrewd. Go, Susan. (laughs) Definitely what you should be doing. And then that run to the phone after Susan leaves is very funny. I mean, George and Elaine didn't see this coming. But I put that on George because honestly, he's the lying expert. So they should have had more details, you know, ironed out as far as importing products and exporting products. So yeah, I think it's George's fault. Obviously, I mean, all of this is George's fault. <laughs> he's the he's the sleazeball that needs to meet up with Marissa Tomei, even though he's engaged. All right, next, we are back at George's apartment. 
George enters rubbing his cheek, the one that Marissa Tomei punched, although... Help me out here, guys. It looks like the wrong cheek. I feel like when she punches him in the park, it's his left cheek because that's sort of what he holds after she runs away from him. But then when he enters, he's rubbing his right cheek. This is super important. So please get back to me. <laughs> this detail, I you know, I can't go on. Anyway, Susan asks right away, what is our Vandalay import? Matches. Long, long matches. Susan punches him in the face and slams the door. <laughs> Very well deserved. All right, back in Florida, there's a board meeting to vote on Morty's impeachment. Morty gloats to Jack that he has the votes. And then he greets Mabel Choate. Hello. Jack looks a bit worried. They go around and vote, and it gets to Mabel, and she votes against impeachment. Jack leans over to Morty. I can't believe you got to that old bag. Uh-oh, hearing old bag takes Mabel back to her marble rye mugging, and she remembers who it was. It was Jerry. She says to Morty, it was your son who mugged me. He says, no way, my son wouldn't rob anyone. He's a good boy. Like father, like son, I changed my vote for impeachment. So everyone turns against Morty. It's pretty much unanimous except for his vote, and he's dismissed as condo president Jack is now president. All right, next we're in Kramer's apartment. The Plaza cable guy knocks. He says he knows that he's in there. And he's like, you win, okay? I can't do this anymore. What do you want, an apology? So he apologizes for all the ways the cable company annoys people. And he says, they're going to change. We're going to keep appointments. And if we can't, we'll call them and tell them we can't make it. Kramer opens the door, apologizes, and they give each other a big hug. The tag to the episode is Helen and Morty leaving their condo for, for good, all sad, you know, walking past the residence on the street on the way to the Cadillac. Morty gives one big wave before driving off. And this is a parody on Richard Nixon and all that kind of stuff when he was impeached, but um, I'm not going to get into that. Okay, I'm going to take a quick break and I will see you on the other side. If life were perfect... Every candle could be lit, every smoked tobacco product could be enjoyed, and every fart could become a pyrotechnic masterpiece. In other words, if life were perfect, you would never run out of matches. Hi, I'm Vandy Arthur. Something happened to me many years ago that changed my life. It was my son's eighth birthday party, and I had forgotten to bring matches to light his birthday candles. And there were none to be found in the entire Chuck E. Cheese. My son wanted so badly to make his birthday wish, but there were no candles to blow out. He still blames that disastrous birthday as to why he failed out of high school can't hold down a job or a relationship, and lives in my basement. That's why, ever since that horrible day, I've dedicated my life to importing the best matches in the world, so that you and your family will always have at least three large boxes in your junk drawer, garage shelf, or doomsday bunker. Imported from Sweden, the match capital of the world, our matches light on the first strike and never break. They are also four centimeters longer and have a slower burn rate, reducing wastage by more than 70% compared to your average match. You could say they are matches made in heaven. Order these premium matches by visiting chipsanddiapers.match. Sign up for our email list, The Match Dispatch, and you will receive 10% off your first case. Chips and diapers. Because you don't want your 42-year-old son living with you. Trust me. And we're back. Okay, for the extras, there were some notes about nothing I thought were interesting. There was an alternate opening line for Elaine in which she opined about the joys of Chinese food to Katie. She says, you know what I love about Chinese food? It's the only food where they'll throw a nut into it. It's a real treat when you find a peanut in Chinese food. Um, 
It's not great, once again. I do think it's better, though, than the Pippi Longstocking thing. <laughs> I don't know. At least it's something. <laughs> it's like, I I just, ugh. as you can tell, the Pippi Longstocking little back and forth is so annoying to me. Originally, the script had Elaine saying that Art Vandelay imports cloth, a lot of rayon, some decron. And she was to say that Art also exported little leather pouches, but they changed it to chips and diapers during filming. I, I love chips and diapers. There's just something so perfectly random about that in the way she delivers it. Chips, um, potato, and some corn. I love the way she delivers that. The IMDb trivia, I think I'm going to start looking at that for some extras as well. This was actually the last episode written by Jerry Seinfeld. I thought that was fascinating. I didn't realize it happened sort of this early. I mean, it sounds it's not like it's early in the series, but um, we still have uh, two and a half more seasons to go. So I was just surprised to read that. And just a little fun trivia. Uh, Marissa Tomei is mentioned by name 26 times in the episode. All right, now it's time to open Greg's Sack Lunch. Every week, Greg, our most dedicated contributor to this podcast, he sends us a sack full of thoughts. And so this week, the first thing I find in Greg's sack are his overall thoughts. He says, I love this episode because it's the opposite of last week's where I felt every storyline was weak. This time, every storyline was both strong and hilariously written and executed. That said, Elaine gets the short end of the stick with her story here, as she is basically just playing support to George, who has one of the funnier plots for him all season. When you have 44 minutes of runtime, give something more to JLD to do, please. Agreed, agreed. I will get more into this in my final thoughts, Greg. Next in the sack are Greg's favorite scenes and Elaine moments. He says, Elaine's support of George's story is fairly weak, so they tried to couple it with her new crush on Jerry based on her realization that he makes a lot of money. I'm not sure about this trait for her, as it has never come up with anyone she's previously met on the show. Nonetheless, she plays it well. I like how concerned she is about Jerry getting to and from the airport, as well as her call to him offering to come down and hang with Jerry at his parents. The part of the phone call where she stops him from hanging up just to say, Jerry, bye, tickles me every time. Oh my gosh. Yes, yes, yes. It's so funny. Oh my God. I love that choice. I don't know if it was written that way or if that was something they figured out on the day, but either way, it's one of the most brilliant moments of the series. As far as Elaine, this being a trait of Elaine's, yeah, it sort of doesn't come up again, but I, oh, well, it kind of does. I, I just, I just thought about that moment with Daryl, the boyfriend she's not sure is black or white. And when he says that he makes over a hundred thousand dollars a year, she was like, it's very good to know, you know? So there's a shallowness to Elaine. Like I said, GD Elaine, gold digger Elaine, although maybe it's just more money obsessed Elaine. Uh, I don't know if she'd be a gold digger per se, but I mean, she likes a man who makes some money. So <laughs> I do think it tracks with her. Next, Greg says, Elaine's best moment is her attempt at being Team Benestanza with George and coming up with an excuse for George with Susan. His dismissal of her ideas is the best moment of this episode for her. She hates him so much, it cracks me up when she even spends a second of time with him. <laughs> Specifically, their scene together at the coffee shop concocting the lie is the best scene of the episode outside of what's happening in Florida. She plays her disdain for him so well. Why is she helping him do this? Um, yeah, I know. Like I said earlier, the whole she gets roped in because she's all dizzy and distracted and mesmerized by Jerry counting money. It's it's not it's not strong. But we do get this scene with them. You know, she just kind of is like, whatever, George, like it's I think it's one of those things. He's not going to let up. And so she's like, fine, I don't whatever. You know, she's made her case about him being engaged. And maybe deep down, she's like, he's going to blow this. It's Marissa Tomei. There's no way this is going to happen. It would have actually been helpful if they kind of clued us in on Elaine being like, hey, it's going to be really funny when she dumps him or something or or when she meets him and she actually isn't interested in him. Like, I think they could have maybe justified it a little bit more with that. But instead of just being like, oh, my God, I'm looking at money. OK, give me the phone kind of thing. But yeah, that scene, I agree, is so, so well done. A little bit of trivia with that. So they loved all these storylines, Jerry and Larry. And so they needed to add some more scenes because it was too long to be a half hour episode, but it was too short to be an hour long. So they had to add a few more scenes to make it a full 44 minutes. 
So anyway, this was one of the scenes they added. This was not in the original script. So uh, how how brilliant. And it just reeks of Jerry and Larry. Like I said, I think they're the best writers on the show by far. They know the show. They created the show. They they know the essence so well. So we get we get these these scenes that are just the meat of why we love love the show so much. Greg goes on to say, unrelated to Elaine, Jerry's parents' ostracization, I can't say that word, <laughs> they were ostracized, <laughs> ostracizations, oh my gosh, uh, Greg, what are you doing to me? <laughs> anyway, well, you know what I'm trying to say. Jerry's parents getting ostracized at the retirement community with appearances by Jack Klompas and Mrs. Choate make this the best storyline of the episode. Having both this and the Marissa Tomei George story together are strong to justify the two-parter. Kramer's story with the cable guy, though as throwaway as most of his stuff, actually cracks me up, specifically because the actor who plays the cable guy is so funny. Agreed. I mean, it's all very, very strong. Um, the Florida stuff. I mean, like I said, Jack Klompas makes me laugh just breathing. He's so funny. So I agree. Everything's really, really strong. You know, I will shit on Kramer's storyline a little bit. But uh, but to your point, it's the guy who plays the cable guy is really funny, really talented. So I'm on board for it. Next, Greg says, I do love the scene where Susan asks Elaine if she's having an affair with George and she cracks up. Terrific laugh acting. Yeah, I said it too. I always crave more of Elaine and Susan together, so at least we get a taste of it here. Ah, agreed. Like I said, I wish there was more of this. It's so, they are so great together. All right, next is Greg's scene swap idea. He says, Tale as old as time, we just need more Elaine. She's playing such second fiddle to George in this episode that she needed to be used more somewhere. There is no scene where JLD gets to play off of Marissa Tomei, which would have been fun to see. Nor do we see her with the Seinfelds, which I always enjoy because Jerry's parents adore her. She could have come down to Florida and played up her money crush on Jerry some more. The more I think of it, this was just a stupid thing to add. If they were going to make this something Elaine really felt about Jerry or rich men in general, they should have played it up more than they did. Or better yet, just not included at all. Kramer and the cable guy play cat and mouse for what feels like a crazy long time, and I'm sure it was given that time because the episode was longer. Of all the things that could have been sacrificed, I would pull time from this to give more of Elaine with Susan or Marissa Tomei. You know, Greg, are we somehow psychically connected? Because I'm not even going to comment on this right now because I'm pretty much going to echo a lot of what you're saying in my final notes. So I'm moving on to your final thoughts. Greg's final thoughts are, I love when the show brings in guest stars to play themselves. Like previously with Keith Hernandez and coming up with Raquel Welch, these appearances always play in really well. George being infatuated with Marissa Tomei is a perfect plot for him, especially throwing Susan into the mix as she gets jealous over his repeat viewings of her films. Oh my gosh, totally. I love this too. Um, <laughs> I think I love when she comes in. You've seen this too. It's another Marissa Tomei movie. Like he's like calling him out at everything. And he literally has like no response. He's just sitting there like a little, like a little boy, like, oh, I love her. Greg says, Marissa Tomei's hair in this episode is so 90s, and I couldn't believe it when I saw it on this viewing. They made fun of Wendy Malick's dated hairdo on this show, but this was seen as beauty, and it goes to show what a crazy mane can do. Is that a bump it she has in there? I swear to God, Greg, maybe. It's so, it's so over-exaggerated. Like I said, there was the Rachel do at this time, which I got and did not look good. I wore my hair in a ponytail for months, but... This was like that when she's on the bench, it's like as teased. I mean, it's like so high on her head. It looks like a wig. And that's such a great point. Wendy's hair was bad. Like <laughs> Marissa Tomei, what is this? But again, 1996, man, we were like in the thick of this terrible layer, like extra layered hairdo for all women. Short, short layers. <laughs> Greg goes on to say Jack Klompas's eyebrows. Stunning. Nothing more to say. They should have been given their own IMDb credit. Oh my gosh, right? Like that first scene when he approaches the Cadillac and that angle we are seeing him from. I swear to God, like, it's not like no one noticed that. I really feel like there had to have been discussion, like going with the hair and makeup people going like, can we trim that down? Maybe the actor who played Jack was like, no, nope, you're not touching my eyebrows. I want him to be flowing. Like that length of eyebrow, 
that like flutters in the wind like that it was a, a, yeah stunning just like i totally agree just like what greg said it's absolutely stunning keep them long well he's dead now but you know you know keep them flowing <laughs> totally in support of that and finally greg says just want to say happy holidays or happy festivus to you shivani and all your listeners Thank you again for including my sack every week. I shall make a donation in your name to the Human Fund. Oh my gosh, Craig, seriously? Money for people? You are too, too kind. Thank you so much. And happy holidays to you as well. And thank you, Greg, for always making every episode of Hot and Heavy that much better with your thoughts. And with that, I will close Greg's sack lunch. Okay, uh, on to my favorite lane moments. I I mean, there's a lot to choose from in this episode, and it's very close, but I think I have to go with Elaine's passionate goodbye on that phone call with Jerry, the bye. <laughs> it's the look on her face. It's the tone in her voice. It's the line delivery. It's everything. I could watch that a thousand times and still laugh. And a very close second is the <laughs> the inaudible ching ching. <laughs> Shin shin. I don't know, but I, but it's so funny because also Jerry goes, what was that? Like, what is happening to you? And my final notes on the episode. Honestly, I don't watch this episode too much. And it's not that I don't like it, but it's just not on my radar for some reason. But it is a solid episode. Obviously, it's an hour long. We have a superstar cameo. It's a very, very good episode. All the plots are pretty strong. But to focus on the Elaine portion... Before watching the episode for the podcast, I was prepared to be unsatisfied with how much she's given for the episode. But I do have to say, I was pleasantly surprised with how many great moments we get with she. I mean, she has two storylines. First, her newly discovered attraction to Jerry because of his finances, and then her involvement with George's storyline with Marissa Tomei. So JLD gets to show a lot of range. And I, I just love her performance throughout the entire episode. She just she she does it everything so well, like what Greg said. Now, I agree with Greg, though. Like, they're not the strongest plots, but at the same time, I, I guess I forgive that because, yeah, I would have loved to see Elaine have, like, her own individual storyline versus being more just of this support role for George's storyline. But you know what? She knocks it out of the park with her performance, and it's so great. And I also agree with Greg here where the whole, you know, her being – newly infatuated with Jerry because of his money. It kind of goes nowhere, just fizzles out. I mean, but we get her flirting with him. (laughs) It's so incredibly great. So I was, like I said, I was, I was prepared to be like, God, you know, whole hour, they barely give Elaine anything, but they give Elaine a lot of range to play with. So as an actress, I think she, she showed a lot of what she could do, which I appreciate. My scene swap would be no surprise to shave off a lot of that Kramer cable guy chase scene, like like Greg said, so we could get more Elaine. Perhaps another scene with her and George as he preps to meet Marissa Tomei. I could see her really like not helping at all, like going like, is that what you're wearing? Or be sure to like not talk about this. Like she would like kind of overcoach him. I thought that would be funny. Or Maybe she gets in Helen's ear. Like maybe I would actually, like Greg said, I mean, if she went down to Florida, that would have also been hilarious because her interaction with the Seinfelds is just so fun. Maybe at the very least calling Helen, (laughs) get something in her ear about Jerry and her together or something. Uh, That might have been actually, that that sounds way too heavy handed and (laughs) very unlike Elaine. Or somehow another scene between Susan and Elaine. Like I said, I just really like them together. That one scene with the two of them is just from start to finish so fun. So however that would have worked, cut out all that chase crap (laughs) because it's just it just is such filler and it's very obvious. So we needed. Yeah, we could have gotten more Elaine if we just cut that out. And lastly, I just wanted to request a gift from all of you. I never mention this on my podcast, but it's always mentioned on pretty much every podcast. And uh, well, I'm going to say it now. If you guys want to do anything for me, I would request you to rate and review Hot and Heavy. That would be my gift. Please give a five-star review. Say what you love about the pod. It really does help. So if you do want to get me a gift, please do that. It'll take like five minutes. And even if you don't want to write anything out, just just hit that five star button. I really want to wish all of you out there just happy holidays, happy new year. I'm going to be taking a break, like I said, for a couple of weeks to enjoy my break with the kids and my family. 
And uh, I will be back next year with the shower head. That's the first episode of 2024. Elaine and her poppy seed problems. It's going to be really fun. <laughs> also, please be sure to follow the podcast on social media. On Instagram, it's at Hot Heavy Elaine. On TikTok, it's at Elaine Menace Podcast. And if you'd like to email me, please do at ElainePodcast at gmail.com. Again, thank you so much for listening. Happy holidays. Happy New Year. And I will see you next time.